Y'all ready to be history? Yeah. All right, hey, there we go. We're out of here. All right, here we go. That's it. Sway, yeah. so before we get started, will you please sign this oh. for me? Oh, oh shit. Damn, wow. <laughs> wow. Look at how, yo, you look, look like that. a kid. You're a kid there. Damn, man, I was a baby, bro. Crazy. That's our teenage years. Y'all didn't know I had bars once, once upon a time, huh? Yeah, you want me to say Marshall? You want me to say? Yes, please. Okay. That's M A R S H A L L. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there you go. Look Hell at that. Yeah, and man. I signed a, a vinyl for him. Man, look at that, man. Look at Incredible. Look Yo, at you're shit. yeah, man, your signature's so much better than mine. Thanks, man. Yeah, no problem, man. Uh, man, you threw me off with that. <laughs> Fucked you up your whole shit. Not really. Uh, I'm just impressed that you dug that deep in the crates, man. I didn't know you. I'm always digging in the crates. Uh, that's good to know, man. That's good yeah. to know. If you want to use any lyrics from any of those songs on that vinyl, well, bro. That, that, I was going to ask you when the cameras are off. There's a couple yeah. bars that I wish I could have. Yeah, that's cool, man. Go ahead, man. What's, what's mine is yours, man. If, it, if it'll make your shit tighter, you know. Let's speak on bars, though. Here we are. <clears throat> um, Kamikaze <clears throat> came out. You know, you shocked the world the way you did it. What, what, what made you do it? I mean, a revival came out December 2017. That wasn't that long ago. It was less than a year. What made you just drop it on the world the way you did? Because I feel like, I feel like the way the climate is right now, if you give people, if you give people enough time to, I got an album coming out in two months, you give people time to say, Man, he better have a song like this or I ain't fucking with it. If he don't have a song like this, I ain't fucking with it. Yeah. He better not be rapping like this. He better not be rapping about this or I'm not going to fuck with it. And when you go into an album, you can go into anything with the mindset of this is going to suck. Mm. And then even if, if, even if you kind of don't feel that way, you're already kind of formed your opinion in front of all your friends. And you know what I'm saying? Like, so I feel like, I feel like, um, Giving them no warning was the best thing to do just because it doesn't give people enough time to, you know, when the revival track list came down the pipe. Yeah, I remember that. It was like, overwhelmingly, this shit is gonna be trash. Yeah. And that was before nobody people, really yeah. wanted to be wrong about it. Yeah. They had already formed, I'm not saying everybody, but a lot of people had already, you know, formed their opinions. So, yeah, that was interesting. Like revival really got ran through the ringer, so to speak, uh, before it even got off the ground. Uh, but you know, it, it, this is that day and age. You know, it's definitely oh yeah, now, yeah, right? yeah. You know, how have you adjusted to that? Like before, which is what I find interesting about you. Before you spent your whole career being critiqued and criticized by organizations like LGBTQ community or college campuses or. Yeah police departments, you know, but hip hop always stood by you. So that was, yeah. your, you know, that's where you found your refuge. But now it came from inside of hip hop. You know, how did that affect you? Me sitting back and, and seeing things that I saw, it was kind of like, I felt like, I felt a bunch of different ways. I felt like, okay, maybe because it doesn't sound like everything else and, and, and what, um, what most people are doing, mm -hmm. maybe that was what tainted their ear. Because I remember a time in hip hop where you had to be so different from the next person or you were trash. There's a shift uh, somewhere that happened that if it doesn't sound like everything else, then it's trash automatically. Yeah. And I just sat back like, okay, all right, I can take that. It's not like I can't take constructive criticism, but I feel like it kind of went beyond constructive criticism. So I had to go back to it. And, and look, I have made albums that definitely probably would not be my, the top of my list. Mm -hmm. what, Encore. Okay. Relapse, which I believe Encore is a better album than Relapse. Relapse is something that I looked at in a couple of years, went back to them and, and cringed at. I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. I didn't even realize I was doing that many accents. I, only, like, I just started, for whatever reason, I just got into it and was just like, started on this weird serial killer vibe kind of thing. Yeah. And started wanting to talk crazy and started bending words more. And the only way you can bend them, bend them is with this accent, trying to use this one. Like, 
And a couple years later, I, you know, in, in, in making recovery and slipping out of that, getting out of the accents and beyond it, um, made recovery. Yeah. And I always say that if it wasn't for relapse, I wouldn't have been able to make recovery. And if it wasn't with, if it wasn't for revival, I wouldn't have been able to make this album. So I'm good with it. It just, you know, some people more than others went a little, a little, little far with it. A little far with it. I, I want to get into that um, uh, too. And I almost, you know, when I listen to Kamikaze and I hear some people say, man, that's the vintage M we wanted, you know, uh, we wanted Shady back, right? And when I listen to it, man, I, I have to admit, man, I hear something in you on this album that kind of made me rejoice <laughs> in a way I've done um, in the past. I like the fact that you're not running from the criticism. I like the fact that in this digital age, you're not, you know, cowering and, and reforming to what people think you should sound like or how people think you should act and you're yeah. calling it out. And I actually like some of these review shows that you see on YouTube and they take people's music yeah. and they have fun with it. I look at these kids M, and, I, and I see us when we were young. Mm -hmm. I see myself when I was younger before Absolutely. YouTube and we'll go through a G-Rap album and Oh, this was dope. That was dope. Yeah. Far Side album. This was dope. Yep. They just kind of doing that, right? right? Uh, and you address them. So you're that in tuned. Like in the, in the beginning of the Ringer, when you talk about if you critique, critique me, you know, you can make millions. If I critique you, there's nothing I really... Yeah, it gets into the territory where it's like, it's like um, you got... Okay, so, so since the internet has become what the internet's become, yeah. and since YouTube and all that, you've got... So many, how can I say this? It's, it's almost like not enough Indians, too many chiefs. Mm. So it's like um, somebody, everybody on the internet and in, in hip hop especially is, it seems like either a rapper, a DJ, a writer, a producer, does something, has something to do with it and it's and, and I love the fact I love the fact that so many people now have been able to get on easier than it was for me or you mm -hmm. back in the day because we didn't have that we didn't have this platform. So I appreciate the platform. It's just that now you've got now you've got people that not only are doing the same thing and they can do it better, but you've got people who don't do anything and are just critiquing it. So I sat back and I'm like. Okay, that's fine. People can talk crazy about me. That's fine. They should they should uh, express themselves and they have a right to. But I also get to say whatever the fuck I want about you now. Mm. I'm like I said, I'm good with revival. Fuck it. Mm -hmm. Because I couldn't have made this album without that. Yeah. And there is something I'm not going to lie. There is something inside me that is a little more happy when I'm angry. It's like as much as I, as bad as it feels yeah. to be there, there's also something about it, there's a rush of it that I like because it inspires me to say something back. So you get in that weird area too where it's like, oh, he says he doesn't care about what anybody thinks about him but now he cares about what everybody thinks about him. No, he's just saying he don't care. He'll say anything he wants about you if you say it about him because he doesn't care. Like there's so many different levels to not caring about shit. You know what I'm saying? But it was interesting. It was definitely interesting because I'm like, how fucking off is my ear? Yeah. Jesus Christ. Like, and then, and then it was interesting to watch the reaction of the chloroseptic remix verse that I did yeah, with two chains and you put yeah. that out in January and you kind of, you touched on you guys formed your opinion just from a track. And that's where I was at. Yeah. It, it, at that point in time, that's yeah. definitely where I was at. But I watched people going, oh, why wasn't this on Revival? Honestly, I what if I said it was on Revival? You won't know because you didn't listen probably. Yeah. But I kind of felt like, okay, I guess this is what people might want because I'm always stuck in that what the fuck do people want? Like, like you were saying that the OM is back and he's too old to be the OM. Mm -hmm. He can't do it. Like, no matter what, when I zig, I should have zagged. 
no matter what, you got half and half every fucking single time. You, you kind of say that. You allude to it in, in, in one of the songs where you said that you set the bar so high that, yeah. you know, at this point, you know, uh, everything's considered a failure. Like, you're almost competing with yourself. Yeah. Um, and you touch on it a lot in every song. Well, not every song, but majority of songs you touch on it, I appreciate. But I have to, like, the Joe Button thing is... It's uh, really interesting because that, along with MGK, of course, is making a lot of noise out there. Mm -hmm. And it, th it throws a lot of folks off when Joe um, first started commenting. Um, it was mixed reactions. Some people said it was disloyal. Some people said, man, he's entitled to his opinion. Mm -hmm. I would assume that obviously it got under your skin, considering the relationship you've had with him with Slaughterhouse. Yes. How do you... How, did, how do you describe your relationship with Joe Budden? How do you describe your relationship with Joe Budden? I mean, listen, me and Joe Budden aren't, you know, we're not friends like that. We're not like, we didn't go to the same fucking high school or something, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So I get that part. But when I'm out here flying around to different places and doing interviews and trying to use my platform to pump up Slaughterhouse every chance I get, and you're using your platform to fucking trash me. And I'm one of the things that keeps this shit moving. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you're doing something, you got a voice in hip hop. So you actually could be affecting this ship a little bit. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Because you don't owe me nothing. But I've never got in a fucking interview and been like, Joe Button shit is fucking trash. Mm -hmm. Now that last album he put out is fucking trash. So that's, that's kind of the attitude I took to this whole album. Kamikaze is like, all right, what if I give everybody my opinion about them? But look, I wanna talk about Slaughterhouse, because uh, there's a lot of, including myself, people that really feel like the Slaughterhouse saga was unfinished. Mm -hmm. You know, I know there's a Glass House <clears throat> album that was pretty much completed but never released, right? Where we had left it about two years ago was everybody came in and different, some, some of the guys in the group picked certain beats, some of the guys didn't feel those beats, so they liked the other beats. And there was like, there was definitely enough songs to put an album out, but for the most part, it wasn't a complete picture because everybody wasn't on the same page of what their favorite songs were. So I thought they were gonna go back, go back home, regroup, and try to make a few more songs. I didn't hear anything from that. And then in, at that point, I started getting really deep into revival. You know, I was recording every day. So a couple months go by. And from what I understand it to be, what I was told, I didn't hear this firsthand, but okay. Joe said, Slaughterhouse ain't hot right now. We don't have a buzz. We need to put out a mixtape. From that point, everybody started branching out. Royce went and did his album, Prime. Like, everybody started doing their own kind of solo shit. So I thought they were just happy with that. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. they just wanted to maybe work on their own projects for a while and we would come back and visit this or whatever. When we made the first Slaughterhouse album. The Welcome to Our House. The Welcome to Our House. That was another album that I felt like, holy shit, people literally just trashed this. They trashed this album. There was a huge fucking backlash of, oh man, this ain't what we want to hear. It sounds too polished and all this shit. Like, you're not, listen, you're critiquing these guys who are fucking wordsmiths. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, so you're, there's, look, there's a certain type of person that, oh man, I like, I only like the beats. There's a certain type of person that will lean towards lyrics more. There's a certain type of person that will lean towards a voice more. They like better. You know what I'm saying? Like, everybody leans towards, towards their own thing. But I was just like, holy shit. Because to me, the beats were crazy on that album. And only thing I did was added my little touch of like sprinkling music in these tracks and mixing them to try to bring out, you know, the production a little bit, um, which I don't even know if I did any actual beats on there on the first album. But but all I heard was the backlash that it was too polished. Yeah. So we said, OK, let's do another album and then you guys do what you want to do with it, which is kind of we left the ball in their court kind of thing. So 
I didn't want to touch it in a sense of like, other than give my opinions on songs, I didn't want to touch it I didn't, with my production because I felt like if, if, what if that is the reason yeah. that they didn't sell albums? I don't want to hinder that, you know what I'm saying? So we gave him another album and next thing I know, I hear Joe talking about who got that money, who, who got what money? Mm -hmm. Like, He did say, I saw a clip that he put up an interview with him and Crooked that he felt like that maybe, perhaps, like he alluded that you and Paul got majority of the money. There, but, the, but the album, I hate to say this because I think the guys are super fucking talented, but the album didn't do much to even recoup the first budget. Then we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on the second album that never came out. What money uh -huh. didn't you get? I don't know if I made a fucking dime off Slaughterhouse. I don't care if I made nothing. I believed in them. So I, you know, I wanted them to, I wanted them to be huge, man. I really did. I, I wanted a group that lyrical to fucking just bust through everything. You know what I'm saying? And it definitely hurt my feelings a lot when the album didn't do good, the first album. It was just like, fuck, man. Like when, when, when we got CeeLo on the hook of the uh, My Life song, I was like, yo, this, is, this might be out of here. What, what was the meaning behind the line when you said the last hit, you, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, the last hit you got was with your ex chick. That was what that was. What's that? That was a tap. Just a tap? It was a tap, but it was also saying that, that his, his uh, alleged domestic abuse mm -hmm. things or whatever, which I'm not gonna get into, but, but I feel like, I feel like the reason I had to do that is because, like I said, there's a, there's, a, there's a fine line between saying, you know what, this guy's really been cool to me. He's helped me out and tried to help out on many occasions. So I'm not gonna go in on Untouchable like that. I'm gonna say it ain't for me not crazy about it, whatever, whatever. But to, to be the worst song you've ever heard in your life? Have you listened to your own shit? Do you not listen back? Because if that's the worst fucking song you've ever heard in your life, I don't know. Uh, yeah, this song is interesting. So we'll never see that Glass House album probably as far as you know. I don't know. I, I, I don't have the answer to that. I, uh, I, I want to just make it clear, though, that aside from the Joe shit, I think that Slaughterhouse is one of the best rap groups ever to ever happen. But that being said, I, I, I wish their first album would have connected. Yeah. To more people than it did. I don't, I don't, to this day, I still don't, me and Paul, I'm like, how, how, what the fuck happened? You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> but look, man, everybody's not gonna like everything you put out all the time. So. That, that was a dream team of MCs, though. And I think a lot to what you're saying um, in regards to why aren't people reacting to these wordsmith is that's how we came up, you know? And honestly, what people may not realize is that's what really separated hip hop from. R&B, rock and roll, and other genres was our ability to bend words to create patterns that made it unique to our genre specifically, which it seems like it's something that doesn't get any credibility. Or, or people don't put a whole, not everybody put a whole lot into that. Now, they don't give a lot of credence to that, you know, which is probably um, Slaughterhouse could have been a victim of that, um, that kind of ideology. Um, you also, in this album, uh, you went in on MGK, you guys had a discrepancy. He mentioned it in his response song, uh, Rap Devil, mm -hmm. you know, that let's call Sway and ask him why I can't get on Shade 4 or 5. That was in um, response, so I seen him on the street once and I didn't know he couldn't come up to Shade at that time, mm -hmm. uh, 4 or 5, and I said, man, come on up, man. And then I had to see him again and say, hey man, I don't know what the shit is, yeah. but until that gets cleared up, there's no way I can have you on there. Yeah. What's the shit with that? What happened? Well, the shit is, just for the record, the, the thing that was going on that he was saying about my daughter, I didn't even know about that until like literally like a year and a half later. Okay. 
I wasn't, it just, it never hit my radar. And then one day, you know, you go down the fucking wormhole of YouTube and whatever, right? <laughs> so I see Machine Gun Kelly talks about Eminem's daughter, whatever, right? So what the fuck? Click on it. Like, yo, why is he? Then he starts doing a, a press run, basically, about Haley. I'm like, what the fuck? Yo, my man better yeah. chill, right? So that's not why I dissed him. The reason I dissed him is actually a lot more petty than that. Okay. The reason that I dissed him is because he got on. First he said, first, first when he said, I, I'm, a, I'm the greatest rapper alive since my favorite rapper banned me from Shea 45 or whatever he said, right? Like I'm trying to hinder his career. So I give a fuck about your career. You think I actually fucking think about you? You know how many fucking rappers that are, are better than you? You're not even in the fucking conversation. I don't care if you fucking blow or if you don't blow. It doesn't matter to me. But then when you get on Tech Nine's album and you start sending shots and people start hitting me up, yo, Machine Gun dissed you, he just dissed you, he dissed you. I'm like, I listen to it, I'm like, did he really diss me though? I keep listening to it. Y'all, this rap, you're not gods. And then somebody sends me a screenshot of his Twitter. And it says, had some shit to get off my chest. You just rap, you not God. Some shit like that. Yeah. And I was like. A reference to the rap God song. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, on the song he said, y'all just rap, you not gods. And on Twitter he said, you just rap, you not God. Had some shit to get off my chest. And I'm seeing, and by the way, this was on the heels of the freestyle he had just did about Shade 45. It's like, shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Now, now I'm in this fucking weird thing because I'm like, I gotta answer this motherfucker. And every time I do that, it makes that person as, as irrelevant as people say I am, am in hip hop, yeah. I make them bigger by getting into this thing where I'm like, I want to destroy him, but I also don't want to make him bigger. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because now you're a fucking enemy. So I'll leave it at that. I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to do at this point right now because yeah. I'm still kind of waiting to see what you haven't heard his rap devil response? No, I heard it. What do you think of it? It's, it's not bad for him. Mm -hmm. He has some good lines in it. it did y'all really call Interscope to try to shelve his? Fuck no. I, I had never made a fucking call, made a call to Diddy, really? Yeah. I got Diddy's number, just hit him up. Yo, Diddy, what up? Never happened. It didn't feel like a diss to me, it just felt like pitiful. Mm. Like, ah, oh, fuck. Now I'm, I'm feeling bad for something I didn't even have to do with. So that's how that happened. So he made a reply to my reply. So regardless of what the fuck he wants to say, oh, it was from six years ago, motherfucker. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Wait. I'm telling you the reason I dissed you now. Yeah. I'm telling you. And I'm gonna sit back and I'm gonna wait for a second just to see, because if people start firing off and I try to answer every fucking buddy that I dissed on Kamikaze or had words about, I'm gonna be going the next five fucking years <laughs> making diss song after diss song. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. like. You're gonna get hit though. Jesse Reyes is featured on this project. Mm -hmm. Young up and coming star. She's on two songs. How did you find Jesse Reyes? Um, I was coming home, I got home one night from a video shoot actually, and she was on TV, it was a Seth Meyers show, mm -hmm. and she was doing that song Gatekeeper. And I was like, who the fuck is this? Cause her voice to me was so crazy. So I rewound it and I was like, oh shit, I gotta check her out. So I went down the wormhole of looking up shit and I was like, yo, I really wanna fuck with this chick cause she, Right now, I'm, I, I, my personal opinion, I think she's going to really blow up. Mm -hmm. That's my personal opinion. I've seen people, very talented people, not do that. But I think that I would put my money on her, that she will absolutely be huge. 
But I don't even know if like necessarily in the pop world or anything like that. I don't yeah. feel like she does pop music. I feel like she she just she comes from a real place and she writes her own shit. First time I got in the studio with her, I played her a couple beats and she just started writing to one right there. Laid a hook. Uh -huh. Good guy. And I was like, oh shit. So she wrote She's the hook. Quick. To good guy. To good yeah. guy. Yeah. The one she's singing at the end. Yeah. There's nice guy, good guy. Good guy. And the reason that that happened is because, oddly enough, she had already had a song called Nice Guy. She had that song, right? So I think that was the last day I was in LA. I came back home and wrote to that one. And then I was like, I want to write to the other one too, but they're both saying, Nice guy, good guy. And I was like, fuck it, I'll make it like it's kind of one song. Uh, Dre's all over this project? Dre's um, input okay. was all over it, mm -hmm. for sure. He, he felt like me and him had a couple discussions about the last album. And one of the things that he said to me was, like he was like, he, he hit me up one day, he was like, yo, I don't like how motherfuckers are talking about your album. And he had heard Revival, right? Yeah. Him and Jimmy Iovine had sat in there and listened to most of the songs I had done at Rick Rubin's studio. And based off that reaction, I, th I think Dre was a little confused too when that happened with Revival. Um, probably not more so than me, but, but we had a conversation um, earlier in the year and I think I had only had one song by that time. It, 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 this was like January. Yeah. I had the one song and was thinking about releasing it. And then wrote another song, got, when I got back to Detroit, recorded it. Like, okay, now I got two songs. I might as well do a fucking album. And that's kind of how that came about. But Dre also, <sighs> there's a couple songs that he kind of deaded them just yeah. because he didn't have a good reaction to him, and he also felt like one of them was going a little far. <laughs> a song, hey, like, what, what does that mean? Like, how far did it go? It's, it, <laughs> it, it, uh, it went, it definitely went too far. Uh, when you say go too far, I feel like Kamikaze was the place where if you were ever gonna go so-called too far, this is where it would be. You did the BET verse for the rap cypher, and in it, you covered a lot of content that was relevant to the world we live in today that some folks want to sweep under the rug. And this is my own personal opinion. Conversations we have every day on, on Shade 4 or 5 on Sway in the Morning. We talk about, you know, the injustice, policies, prejudice. We talk about discrimination, all of these different things. Whether or not we, we're in the middle of a race war that is trying to be perpetrated by people in power. Mm -hmm. Not a war in the sense where people are going to pick up guns and shoot at, well, maybe, shit. Right. You know? mm -hmm. But in terms of um, psychologically, the whole nine. So when you did that verse on the BET cipher, what I thought why it was necessary, King Crooked had a song called I Can't Breathe, where he talks about, man, we can't just be the only one saying this. White rappers shouldn't stay quiet. White rappers shouldn't stay quiet. I can't tell you how hard that line hit me. It was to the point where I'm like, this is how strong I feel about something. I got to put it in the right words, you know? And I saw shit where it was like, oh, these are, these are not new subjects. They're new to Eminem and, you know, that kind of shit. How did you respond to that reaction? You, did, you got backlash for that. You mm -hmm. know, when you, especially when you I got backlash for the Trump cipher and, and yeah. you know, it is what it is. At least at least when this shit is all said and done, maybe I can just be on the right side of history. But you got people dissecting the bars and going, oh, this shit is trash. It's not even that good. And like, that's not what it's about. You're missing the whole point. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to like I'm trying to say this also to my fan base who might have voted for him. A lot of people in, in my fan base probably did. And at the time I did the cipher, I realized after it was all said and done that maybe, maybe I should have just attacked him. When you said I, I draw, you drew that line in the sand, maybe yeah. you should have not done that. You should have reworded it and 
So the empathy towards Well, that's us. what I realized after yeah. I was done. That's kind of how I felt because it's like, okay, this is, this is like, this is backfiring on me and I don't care. I don't give a fuck if, if that's what happened and hurt my sales. I don't care about that. Yeah. I care about the message I'm trying to convey. Why you felt the need to stand up though? What was that for you as Marshall? What made you decide? Because, because I was just watching it every single day. I watch a lot of news, right? Yeah. The thing that pissed me off the most, that really set me off to, when I started going crazy with the pen, because I'm like, the Kaepernick thing. Mm. And when that shit happened and how he kept changing the narrative and kept changing the narrative, you fucking, ah, I, I, I can't, I can't, um, I don't want to get into this whole Trump okay, thing we, anymore, we, we, but... Uh, well, you mentioned at the end of the ringer, Asian Orange sending a Secret Service uh, to your house. Did the Secret Service really come to your house after that? They came to my studio, yeah. Okay. And they asked, they had, they were just basically asking me questions about my lyrics to see if, what the intent was behind them. Mm -hmm. And if I was making a actual threat or just expressing myself, so... So that really happened. Wow, that's crazy. Right now, what we're seeing, too, because Colin Kaepernick was named the face of Nike's 30th anniversary of, of Just Do It. You saw that, right? And then you got a whole slew of people that are now burning Nike shoes and, and Nike products. I saw that. Products. It's infuriating. Yeah, what do you think? Infuriating. Yeah. Like, really? The, the, the Nike supports people who kneel for the anthem at this fucking point. Come on, seriously? Seriously, you gotta be a fucking moron to think that that's just what it's about and it's that fucking cut and dry. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's a meaning behind this shit and there's real pain behind this shit. And you're burning a fucking pair of shoes? When you go about your fucking day and you got your job and you're doing, thinking about all this other shit, that's what really fucking bothers you? People ain't gonna stop watching football. They're just not. Yeah. Football to me is the best sport there is. And what draws you to the game should not be, if, if that's how you feel about your country and you feel like you should stand for the anthem, stand for the anthem, that's fine. But you also need to realize that this is America and people have died for these rights to be able to protest and to be able to take a knee. Stop making it fucking personal about yourself. You have nothing to do with this. Mm. I agree. Uh, we got to get back to Tyler, the creator, man. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Tyler's, you know, and um, I, I recently saw him perform. I know that Tyler was a big fan of yours growing up, right? And then um, I recall you even reading about you saying some good things about our future, how they're pushing boundaries years ago. Yeah, for sure. And you said some great things about them, about them um, as a talent, as pushing boundaries, as a group, our yeah. future as a whole. Yeah. What happened with you guys? Yeah, no, I really did like them. I, I, I thought like, um, I thought their movement was really cool too. Did y'all make music? We didn't make music, um, but you know, I just felt like, okay, there's a mutual respect, respect, you know? And a lot of the shit that, that ended up happening after that, like the tweet he put out with talking about Shady 15 and why can't people that are close to him tell him that his shit sucks and it's trash and I'm like, okay, listen, man, you don't have to like it and it could really suck. But being that somebody really was cool to you you would expect some kind of reciprocation and just don't we, go public with it and publicly express your opinion and how much my shit is trash. Okay, so I, talk, I chalk it up to them being young and just kids, you know what I'm saying? So it was like, all right, I've been there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I was a dick when I first came out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, Yeah, man, you were. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I feel bad about it. I'm sorry if I ever was a dick to you, but I don't think I ever was. Was I? Yeah, one time, man. But hey, hey. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. We'll, we'll talk about that. Okay. Um, no, nah, man, so I liked him. And, and then Earl Sweatshirt gets in an interview after, after Tyler trashes me. And then Earl Sweatshirt, anybody who listens to Eminem's drinking too much Mountain Dew. And, and I'm just like, really? 
Like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you guys were just on tour with us. We hung out. Like, we, we kicked it. Make jokes. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, so the last straw, like, look, I know a lot of this shit. I could, I, I could come across being very petty. Yeah. But at a certain point in time, someone has their breaking point. You know what I'm saying? So when Tyler tweeted out the thing about Walk on Water, this fucking song is horrible. I was like, all right, I need to say something now because this is fucking stupid, Mm -hmm. you know? But at the same time, I'm not going to let everybody just keep fucking, I'm not going to be America's punching bag and motherfuckers just want to think it's cool and safe to say whatever the fuck they want about me. I think it shocks people, M, because for all your career, you was the I just don't give a fuck guy. That can work both ways. How so? Because you don't give a fuck, you will fire back at somebody who says something about you. I picked and chose who to, that I wanted to say my piece with. Yeah. Because a lot of those things were personal but then there's a lot of things that aren't personal on Kamikaze. You know, it's just the game and competition. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And spirit of an MC. Spirit of an MC, yeah. But, um, you know, with the Tyler, the Creator thing, man, I, 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 I realize now, and I, I realized when I, when, I, when I said it, but I, I, I wasn't like in the mind frame of, I was angry when I said the shit about Tyler. The fact of like, every time I saw this kid, like, always so cool to you. You know what I'm saying? Like, I I, I loved his energy, like everything, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. he was a funny dude, like he's super charismatic and shit, but I'm, but I'm sitting back like, man, at what point, at what point do I have to say something just to defend myself? And I think that the word that I called him on the album was on that song was one of the things where I felt like this might be too far because in my, in my, the homophobic, in my quest, yeah, 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 in my quest to hurt him, mm-hmm. I realized that I was hurting a lot of other people by saying it. And at the time I was so mad, it was just whatever. But in the midst of everything else that was going on on this album and, the things that it took to pull this album together and all that kind of shit. It was one of the things that I kept going back to going, I don't feel right with this. Before the album came out, I had the conversation with Paul and we spun the word back. But now I realize people can hear what I'm saying anyways. In the case of this, man, I I feel like just, man, I wish you and Tyler could sit down and hash that one out now that you fired your shot back and he said what he said because i think that's a special young man and and he could probably use your mentorship and and you could probably feed off of of what he has to offer as well i could tell it's different from joe or some of the other yeah it's definitely different it's not it's not it's it's not as personal it's one of them things like all right dude you 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 deserve a tap now because I think you thought it was cool to just because you slid with the other things mm-hmm. and I didn't say shit because like I said, I was chalking it up to them being young and just kids, man. I'm like, but at the same time, at what point do I just got to keep I'm gonna taking switch this? topics because something I see, I keep hearing this reoccurring theme about how important writing is, yeah. you know, um, one of my favorite tracks on the album is featuring an up and coming star that I think uh, he, along with others that you mentioned on the album, like Sean or Joyner. Kendrick or J. Cole. Yeah, Joyner Lucas, um, powerful, real powerful artist. Um, I like y'all together on this track. You know, I think it's a good mesh between a, a veteran and somebody who's on the rise. He's so good too. What is it about him that, that you like? The first time I saw him was like five years ago at the at one of the BET ciphers. And I peeped how he was like, he was saying a lot of lines that, I saw some of me in that, but at the same time, I, it was different because it was like, early on in my career, whenever I get to do a BET cipher, 
I want to try to, I want to write till my shit stands out. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. And he stood out so much to me. I was like, yo, he's, he was talking about Miley Cyrus. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure it was something like that. But he was talking about pop stars and he was doing this kind of thing. But I'm like, yo, people are going to remember that. I remembered it. And then I kind of started when he made the, the Ross Cappuccini. Yeah. The way he did it from the two perspectives. Um, it was genius and it was like stood out. Mm -hmm. stood out so much to me like I not only that though like the rhymes like I'm listening to the rhyme that's when I'm listening to a rapper I'm listening to to what you're bringing to the table as far as a skill set right that's the first thing I'm honing on but the fact that like I said like he's not compromising bars to tell his story he's still got complexity in there yeah you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. and he's he but he's the more the rhyme went like he's taking you on his journey and I never snapped out of that journey till it was over you know what I'm saying? Like, and I was like, yo, this kid is fucking incredible. Y'all got a, some, and I'm paraphrasing, I can't remember the lyrics exactly, uh, but you come in with a verse where you say, I got a couple of mansions, but I still don't have any manners. You got a couple of goat writers, but to these kids, it don't actually matter. What the fuck happened to hip hop? What's going on with hip hop? People took that line and thought you were uh, indirectly talking about Drake. No, see, here's the thing. I saw, and I saw that too. Yeah. Drake is always going to be in my good graces because he did something for, for one of my daughters that I'll never forget, and he will always be in my graces with that. And I like Drake. Mm -hmm. What I'm telling you with these lines is I don't know what's real and what's not at, at this point. You know what I'm saying? Because you hear shit about this rapper, that rapper, whatever. I'm telling you that I don't do it. Mm -hmm. Never have and never will. If I ever need a ghostwriter, I need to just fucking put the mic down. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's my personal belief. As far as anybody out here that, that does use ghostwriters, that's fine. That's, if that's what you do, that's fine. But yeah. I'm telling you, I don't do it. Hip hop was the most important thing that empowered me as a kid. It made me feel... I have a line where I say it made me feel tough when I wasn't. Yeah. When I was a scrawny little kid, growing up on 8 Mile, walking up the fucking block, put headphones on, and it made me feel powerful. Hip hop probably was, I, I mean, it was, it, was, it was like my dad, mm. hip hop. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And it was the only thing that made me empowered. It made me feel good about myself. And when I started being able to write rhymes and figured out I could do it, that's where the feeling comes from to me because the excitement is being able to come up with the shit. You know what I'm saying? It taught me how to throw my first punch, gave me the confidence okay. to be able to throw my first punch and to realize not only that, the fact that Proof used to beat my ass all the time in the backyard boxing. And one time he beat me like literally to the fucking ground <laughs> and he was just like, "M, just stop. Cause I kept getting up, coming at him, but I'm like, I, but I just kept get, getting beat up. He was fast, man. He was very quick, and uh, <laughs> but it made me realize, like, okay, taking a punch is nothing. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, it's not your fear when you're a kid is like, oh my god, if I get hit, mm -hmm. what's it gonna? Oh, what if they hit me in the nose and it jams my nose in my brain and I die? Like, kind of shit you think about. But nah, man, hip hop, uh, hip hop, like since its beginning. I was always under the impression that every rapper wrote their rhymes. And when you heard about Kumo D battling Busy B, uh -huh. it was who's bringing the best rhymes to the table. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Who's going to be able to say the best shit? Who's the cleverest and the wittiest? And then years later, fast forward, you hear Easy E saying, Ice Cube writes the rhymes that I say. Uh -huh. And I remember being a kid, like hearing the line, but it never really, I, I, I just didn't really care. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? It, it didn't really affect the way I felt about Easy e or the way I felt about NWA. I think in all fairness though, I think Drake uh, is a superior writer to be able to sustain the uh, level of success he has. Yeah, I mean, he makes great music. There's not really even much you can say about it. You know, on this Kamikaze album, I feel like I was pretty direct at who 
yeah. I was kind of taking shots at and going at and who I wasn't, you know yeah. what I'm saying? I wouldn't send subliminals to Drake for, there'd be no reason for me to do that. But I am expressing to you that regardless of what any of these other dudes do, I have never, not even a line, not even anything. I wouldn't be able to have fun with it if I couldn't write it. That makes sense. You you go in really hard about the Grammys in a way, um, man, you kind of, you drag the Grammys in the mud and you talk about uh, you have a few Grammys, but you feel like you had to sell your soul to get them. And um, you didn't know if you wanted it for, for the recognition or the trophies, but yeah. then what's the difference? You know, and that Grammys pretty much suck the blood of artists and nominate them, have them come to the shows. and Which they do. Is they that do what? it every fucking year. Yeah. And I, I, I got, I'm just tired of seeing it. And for whatever reason, it's like they're always pitching this hint that you might win album of the year, which is a, used to be a big deal. I don't think it's a big deal now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sat at home this year for the Grammys and watched Jay and Kendrick not get it. And I felt like one of them should have got it. I felt like Joyner Lucas should have won a Grammy for I'm Not Racist. Yeah. Absolutely should have won a fucking Grammy. Every year we, we, we went, it was, I would be up for album of the year. And then the winner is Nora Jones. Who? And I, I don't, I'm not even trying to say anything bad about her music. I just, at that point, I had never heard of her. Yeah. And none of my friends did either. You know what I'm saying? So we were like, okay, whatever. And then Steely Dan. Okay, I know who Steely Dan is. I know Steely Dan back in the day. You know what I'm saying? But more than the Marshall Mathers LP impact, like, okay, fine. I watched 50, same shit. 50 did not win Best New Artist at the Grammys. There was nothing bigger than 50. Nothing bigger, and nobody, yeah. nobody since maybe like Snoop came out the gate mm -hmm. like that. My first album didn't do it. I, I never saw someone's first album and the, the wave happen like he had. And then he doesn't get it. And then I get up there another year, and what was it, the Eminem show? And it was like, what? I'm fine if I lose to fucking Kanye or someone that I'm like, okay, I respect that. I know who that is. And Kanye has a huge following and he's made a massive impact on music. Fine, I'm good with that. But don't fucking get us all here to use your selling point for your fucking show and stiff everybody every single fucking time. And I said, after that point in time, I was like, don't ever ask me to fucking come here again. Please do not ask me. My answer is no for a hundred million years. Never again will I fucking go to the grave. Well, well now, you know, I know the Jimmy Jam and, and, and some of the members of the board, they are reaching out, Just Blaze and different folks are, are now trying to make it better. Would you ever consider, you know, joining the board and maybe you have a vote in it? First of all, that vote is fake as fuck. That's not a real vote. That's not a real vote. They give it to who, who they want to give it to. They give it to their darlings, the fucking, oh, this got critical acclaim, but it sold two records. Like, I, it ain't about always what you sell. I get that, Vanilla Ice, I understand. You know what I'm saying? Like, but there comes a point where when an overwhelming something comes along that has this wave and impact on music and you give it to fucking, Lada fucking Dottie. Who? Lada Dottie. It's only Lada Dottie. But you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, man, I, I don't know who won over Kendrick and Jay. Bruno Mars. Bruno Mars is fucking incredible. Bruno Mars is great. But I remember Beyonce didn't win for the album Lemonade. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> I was like, what the hell? You know? It's it? like they're so fucking tone deaf to yeah. what is actually going on, but they're not in a sense of, oh, we're gonna get Beyonce here, we're gonna get Jay here, we're gonna right. get, we can say all these names are gonna be here and we'll make them think, I guarantee you, I guarantee you that the people from the Grammys was on the phone with Beyonce's people or Jay-Z's people saying, every year that they're up for something, hinting they're gonna win to get them to come there. So you over that. I fucking guarantee you. You over that. Um, I guess I won't see you at the Grammys this year. Yeah, probably not. Probably not? Okay. Yeah. What if you're nominated? 
first of all, I won't be. Okay. Because they know that I don't like them. And if I was, I wouldn't win because they know that I don't like them. One final question. I want to ask you about a song that, uh, to me, man, it was probably one of the most heart-wrenching songs on the project was Stepping Stone. You know, and it, you tell the history of uh, D12, how it started, you know, and, and what happened through the duration. And at the end of it, you said it's over. That's it. Uh, were the members aware of that song? They were. They were? Okay. They were. Um, they, got, they got a heads up and, you know, I explained... I honestly, I have not talked to Swift and, and uh, Conniver yet mm -hmm. about the song. They just knew it was coming down the pipe. But uh, the way I explain it is this. Proof was the glue that binded us all together, right? He did so much shit behind the scenes that I didn't even realize and did things to keep us a group and to motivate us mentioned that you guys knew all this stuff was happening um, but y'all never talked about it you know you were men you know I'm, I'm paraphrasing in the verses but everybody was doing their solo projects and you know y'all was drifting further apart well that's what ended up happening was everybody was kind of doing their solo things we made solo projects mixtapes and things like that and did we're doing shows and i think the conversation now going forward is to see if there's anything we can do to help their solo careers you know, and we'll always be friends, man. We always been friends. So we were kids, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So we'll always be good on that aspect, you know? And I want to help them do whatever, whatever it is that their next thing is mm -hmm. on the agenda. You know what I'm saying? Mixtape, album, shopping, whatever it is. When I listen to the, these stories and I've known you since the nineties and uh, I've known you through these ups and downs. And even if I wasn't there on your side, I was there on your team, so to speak, you know. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, man, this man must have went through some great therapy because right now where you at, you seem like you're in a comfortable place. You know who you are, you know what you want. And even though you got these people coming at you, you're strong enough to respond in a way that you wouldn't naturally do it. Um, how did you get to this place though? Did, the, did you do therapy, was it? No, nah, I just, my music is therapy, uh -huh. you know? So I just, uh, I don't know, man, I've been coasting through and I feel like I just, I always, I write all the time, uh -huh. whether I use it or not, you know, I write all the time and that's my best therapy is to be able to get stuff out. Just like the D12 song, it was like one of those things where like, I know that they have things they want to say to me and I have things I want to say to them. So this is kind of how I wanted to tell them, like, you know, I love you guys, like, forever. Like, I'm here. It just, doing the G12 album just doesn't seem, in this climate right now, Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how that would, would even work. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. You're going through enough with this climate. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> so... Imagine D12. Let me ask you this, moving forward, this will be my final question. Um, you have always, to the public, seemed like an elusive, uh, introverted person that they don't always have access to unless- I think that's hilarious. Okay. By the way, you know, I'm not going to fucking clubs anymore. I don't do that. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I'm sober. I don't. But I do a lot more and go a lot more places than people actually think I do. Mm -hmm. I just do it under the radar, man, that's all. We don't, you know, in Detroit, we don't have paparazzi like LA or New York, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So I'm out a lot. Mm -hmm. It's just that people don't really see me. So you out and about. Yeah. That's interesting to know. Like I said, you're not gonna catch me at a club fucking throwing money, or, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I've been through all those days and, and, and all that shit, like as far as, you know, I've done the whole club scene. Yeah. I did it for a long time. Too long. Nah, but M, uh, congratulations, man. I like the Kamikaze Project. Thank you, man. Um, I think the majority of folks who listen to it cannot deny that uh, you're in an elite group of lyricists. Thank uh, you. And I'm a dude who's been in this for multiple decades, and you're at the top of my list. You Thank know? you, man. And, Thank and you. I, and I like to see you keep flying forward, regardless of the, you know, whatever the critics have to say. They've been, they've been, you've had critics since your first album. Mm -hmm. You know, so 
that, that's what it's going to be. But I think people can appreciate the fact that you fire back, that you ain't going to stand for it, um, and that you still are making, you're still making great music. So congratulations, brother. Absolutely. Thank you, man. Yeah, man. Appreciate I'm it. And listen, I'm glad I could sign that vinyl for you, man. Hell yeah. You know, if you want to... Like I said, I'm going to take it home. Check out some bars. Okay, here, let me see that. Show that, show that. This is, you see that? Sway and Tech, shout out to yeah. King Tech. This is my brother, partner in crime since high school, since day one. Still Sway and Tech, live forever. Shave 4 5, Monday nights. Make sure you tune in, okay? Shave 4 5. Shave 4 5, damn it. <laughs>